Hi everyone, welcome to today's web webinar as part of the Stormwater Fundamental Series Pipe Design being presented by Sean Quilty. Um, just while we wait for a few more people to get on and before I introduce Sean, just kind of going through a bit of information before we get started. Um, slide. Um, so today's webinar is part of a series that Ocean Protect are doing in partnership with Quilty Engineering Hub. And so to, this is the third one, which is looking at pipe design with a range of other ones being presented throughout the rest of the year. Uh, more information about all of those can be found at oceanprotect.com.au slash webinars um, with a bunch of other guests and speakers at those events. Otherwise, you can also subscribe to our newsletter at oceanprotect.com.au slash newsletter to find out more about our events coming up. Also, just for a little bit of a update for people interested in the maintenance side of WUSID, um, I'm working on a project called the WUSID Maintenance Compliance Framework, which is looking at providing information, resources, and tools to help councils improve maintenance of WUSID assets. And so that is being released next month, and more information about that can be found available at the wusidcompliance.com.au website. You can scan the QR code or reach out to me after today and we can have a chat if anyone's interested in that, but really looking to help solve a, a long industry problem that we've been facing. Also, um, if you could please complete the poll survey um, during the survey, I've, put, I've launched it so you can engage with that. It's a really good way for us to get some data out of you to understand kind of where the industry is at in terms of these questions. The slides and recordings will be made available after the webinar, probably, um, yeah, will be made available later at oceanproject.com.au slash webinars. And if you're after a CPD form, you can request that at inquiries at oceanproject.com.au. Now I will be handing it over to Sean to talk about pipe design. Um, for the people who have been part of the past two webinars so far, you'll probably be used to him. But for the new people here, I'll let him introduce himself just to start off. Yep, I'll let you take over. John. Thanks, Dan. Uh, welcome, everybody. So we're uh, now going into the third webinar of this series. So the idea was the first three webinars, uh, I would come in and just give everyone a bit of an introduction into um, essentially leading to pit and pipe design. So the first webinar, we covered the rational method. Uh, and looking at catchment analysis and the hydrology behind that. The second webinar, we jumped into inlet design. So once we knew how much water the catchment was actually uh, generating and how much runoff, we could then size our inlets to see how much we actually capture. And today, I'll just share my screen and get this up. Today, we're going to jump into uh, pipe design. So. Now we've got an idea of how much water is generated, how much runs towards an inlet. It drops into the inlet and we can capture that efficiently. And now we're gonna look at the pipe design. Uh, so just to give you a bit of an idea of what we will cover today. Sure, um, and you'll need to share your screen properly. Oh, if you want it, it's just showing sure. the full PowerPoint. Gotcha. How about that? Is that better? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dan. Cheers. Um, so, so today, what we're going to look at is um, the pipe design and hydraulic grade line analysis is quite a big topic. There's a lot involved. So what I'm hoping to do is first break into the, the physical elements of pipe design. Physically, what are we talking about? Um, and then I'm just going to uh, drop a bit of uh, theory or background information, uh, some of the terminology that we use once you start to get into um, true hydraulic grade line analysis. But we won't be covering, covering a detailed HGL. Uh, we, we just can't fit it in 45 minutes, unfortunately. But what we do have is a, um, I guess a simpler method that we do use in the industry. Uh, and that will allow you to size pipes or a pipe network, uh, basically with pen and paper and a calculator. So no real need for computer software um, or hours and hours of just churning and crunching numbers. It'll give you a um, basically a pipe design, you know, within, oh, depending on how big it is, within an hour, basically, you can size all of your pipes for your own subdivision or whatever project you might be looking at. So that's the, the plan for today. So if there is terminology and content that you don't quite understand or seems a bit um, 
bit scary at first, don't worry. Um, this is really just giving you a bit of an introduction into it. Um, and hopefully that will then lead you onto um, uh, further study or courses or training. Uh, and you might be a bit more familiar when you do actually jump into it. All right, let's get started. Okay, so we are using uh, local standards again. So it is an Australian based um, approach, obviously that we're doing here. Um, I have taken out uh, some content from QDM, Queensland's Urban Drainage Manual, but the majority of the content that we're looking at is actually uh, compliant with OSROAD's Guide to Road Design, part 5A. Now that part talks specifically to uh, drainage and uh, longitudinal drainage, so our pit and pipe systems. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to do that is uh, over the last couple of webinars, we saw there was a lot of people in, um, not just in Queensland, we have a lot of people in New South Wales and Victoria uh, and then elsewhere as well. Uh, so I wanna make sure the content that we're learning today is something that you can apply anywhere around Australia. Um, so two great guidelines there. Uh, the Osroads Guide to Road Design, that's free. So if you just provide your email address to Osroads, you'll actually get access to all of their guidelines, uh, which I think is brilliant. So if, if you've got any questions about that, um, you can uh, hit me up um, after the, uh, the webinar and, and I can give you details how to uh, get an account there. All right, so let's first look physically what we're talking about when we look at piped systems or pit and pipe design. So the pipe network consists of a few elements. We have drainage inlets, and I think we're all pretty comfortable with that uh, on the back of the last webinar. We've got access chambers, underground pipes, and then outlets. So our pipe system is a gravity-based system. And so that means that when the water drops into our inlets and runs through our pipes, we need to make sure the pipes are free draining. So gravity itself will actually force all the water out. So those pipes are completely empty once the storm passes through. Um, all of those uh, pipe systems need an outlet. Obviously we need to discharge that water somewhere. So as I said before, drainage inlets, I think we're pretty comfortable with that. But just to recap, the drainage inlets, the, the role uh, of the inlets is to capture our surface runoff. So we wanna push all of that surface runoff, the above ground flows, we wanna push that underground. And one of the main reasons why we do that is to control our flooded limits. So when we're looking at the approach flow, we need to make sure we have safe flooded widths, depths, and our depth velocity product. So they need to be within a certain threshold uh, to ensure that people, uh, vehicles, pedestrians, and properties are safe from flooding. So these drainage inlets will redirect our flows underground into our pipe network. We then have access chambers. So you can see here two pipes uh, connecting and changing direction. And so this is typically where we would provide what we call an access chamber. So these access chambers don't necessarily capture flows. There's no water that's gonna drop from the inside uh, intentionally. Um, and we provide them at changes of pipe direction, like you can see here in the image, or changes of grade or changes of pipe levels. We also provide them at pipe junctions. Uh, you can have pipes that are connected in series to, to form a bend, but typically you want to avoid that. Uh, really, if you're going to change direction, you want an access chamber at that location. So then we look at pipes. Obviously we need that for a piped uh, network system. So the pipes are going to convey our captured runoff from our inlets and actually discharge them to another location. So we can have multiple pipes interconnected within a system, but these pipes can also be a single reach as well. Now by a single reach, I mean from one point to the other and it doesn't change uh, direction uh, and it doesn't change grade. It's just one long conduit essentially. When we look at those single reaches, we start to get into the, um, the space of culverts, which we won't cover today. That's probably a, another session in itself, I think. 
So again, these systems are gravity systems. And that means they need to freely discharge. And ultimately, they will be discharging to places like a detention basin, bioretention systems, rainwater harvesting tanks, existing pits, or a headwall outlet. So eventually, these pipes have to empty out all of that captured runoff. Then we have our outlets. So this allows the pipe network to discharge all of that captured stormwater. Now at those outlets, we don't just leave the pipe uh, as itself, just the end of the pipe sort of sticking out of the ground there. We provide what we call headwalls, and this provides a stable and a controlled point of discharge. So this can help uh, reduce any scouring or erosion problems that you might have with all of that uh, stormwater runoff just, just flying and um, uh, discharging out of your pipes. So there were the physical elements that we're looking at. So hopefully you get a bit of an idea of, of what they look like when you actually go and put these things in the ground. So now I'm just going to cover some terminology uh, that you'll uh, come across, um, especially when we get into pit and pipe design, but also uh, some terminology that I'll use you might not have heard of before, and that's hopefully leading you towards a hydraulic grade line analysis uh, sort of content or, or training. So when we look at our terminology, we have our pits, but they can also be called uh, chambers or structures. Uh, and as we looked at in the last uh, webinar, the inlets can be called all sorts of different things. You might have gully pits, side entry pits, field inlets, um, drop pits. There's all sorts of names, but essentially we're looking at just a uh, really, it's just a, a chamber um, type structure. Uh, pipes, and I don't hear too many other terms for that. Pipe is pretty much a pipe. Now, when we're doing designs, our pipe length from a design purpose is actually measured from the center of the pit to the center of the pit. So it's not a true reflection of the length, but that's typically what we adopt for design purposes. We also look at pipe cover, which is really important. Uh, and that's measured from your surface level vertically down to the crown of your pipe. We then look at our pipe slope, in this case, SO, subscript O there. Um, but in a few slides, we're going to look at something called friction slope, SF. And I don't want you to confuse the two. They are two very different things. Your pipe slope is the physical pipe grade itself. The friction slope is something different. Looking into the pit now in a bit more detail, we can see our pipe has an invert level. So that's the lowest point inside your pipe and an obvert level. And that's the highest point also inside your pipe. Our pipe crown is the highest point on the outside of your pipe. And it's important to remember when you're looking at minimum cover requirements that you're measuring to the crown of the pipe because your pipe uh, wall, the thickness of that wall, uh, could vary anywhere between 30 or 40 millimetres up to 100 millimetres thick. Uh, and so it does make a difference when you're looking at cover requirements. So don't confuse uh, the cover and measure to the obvert. It needs to be measured to the crown. And then typically with our pit structures, we'll have a pit drop. So this is the difference in elevation from your incoming pipe invert level to your outgoing pipe invert level. So there is a difference in elevation. And this helps to ensure free draining through the pit. Now, some states and territories will actually have a sump underneath here as well. So I know on Tasmania um, projects that I've worked on, uh, we also provide a catch sump in there to catch any, any sediment. Um, so you might see some uh, slight um, uh, variations of, of what you see here. Um, but obviously, if you have any questions, you can always reach out. All right. So when we're looking at pipe design, obviously, we need to analyze the pipes uh, in conjunction with the pits. So it, it, it acts as a interconnected system um, of voids to allow this water to uh, be conveyed through the system. 
And so pressure head is something that's really important in these calculations. So when we talk about pressure head, uh, the it, it's essentially the force that the water exerts due to the weight of the water above it. So if we look at this image here and we have a pipe, let's say that pipe was just opening to uh, air or to the side of a, a hill. If that water was to fill up in the pit, as you see here, you can imagine that that column of water that is sitting there is actually going to force its way down through gravity and actually push its way through that pipe. So that um, column of water, if you like, that is actually uh, an amount of pressure or what we call head uh, that's measured vertically in meters. Uh, that's, al that's allowing or forcing that water out of the pipe. So the different pressure that you might have within a pit or the different depth of water will affect your flow rate. So this will change how quickly that water flows through the pipes. And this is a pretty big concept that we need to uh, respect when we get into pipe design. So the greater the pressure head, the faster the water will flow. And now if we think to a, a very uh, common um, formula we'll, we'll look at shortly as well, our flow rate is equal to our velocity times our cross-sectional area. So if you have uh, a certain amount of pressure in that pit and it's forcing or causing a certain velocity, if that velocity increases, your discharge rate will also increase. Okay, so your area stays the same, but you'll be able to convey more water through that pipe. So in here, we've got a certain amount of pressure or head within that pit, and that's gonna force a certain velocity. Let's say it's one and a half meters per second. Now, if we added more water or if we had more water within the pit, our pressure is going to increase. Our head is going to increase and that will cause a higher velocity. We can go one step further, and if that pit was full virtually to the top, uh, that pressure is gonna increase again, which causes an even higher velocity going through that same pipe. So that's a, a pretty um, solid concept to really grasp before we get into pipe design. So with that knowledge now, we can look at the hydraulic grade line. So a hydraulic grade line or a HGL represents the pressure head in a pipeline at any given point along that pipeline. So the pressure head at any point along the HGL is the vertical distance to that point. So if this is the hydraulic grade line that you see here, at any point along that system, you can measure vertically and that will give you the amount of pressure that's in that system, either inside the pipe or the pit itself. So we can think of this as the effective water level. So something that I was uh, taught um, back in uni days, uh, many, many years ago now, <laughs> 20 odd years ago, um, if you could imagine that pipe there where we've got the HGL, if you were able to put a, a tiny hole within that pipe, um, so small that it doesn't actually affect the flow rate of that pipe, the water will basically spring up of that pipe up to that hydraulic grade line level. So that's kind of what it's trying to tell you. The, the pressure of that water is up at a certain point, um, but because the conduit is closed, you can't actually see that water level, but the pressure is built within that system. And another thing to just point out, and when you start getting into HGL analysis, uh, the flow velocity is a function of your hydraulic grade line, not the pipe grade. So how much flow is running through that pipe is in this case, it's determined by your HGL, how much pressure is in the system. The pipe grade itself can actually change and your HGL may not change at all. So you can get a, a hydraulic grade line with a lot of pressure upstream, and you can try to force your pipe to be really steep, but it won't actually uh, make your design any better because it's the hydraulic grade line that uh, dictates how much water can flow through your system. So we won't go into these details. I did just want to sort of share a couple of simple equations because um, you're probably wondering 
how do we start calculating this? Where do these numbers come from? Where do these grades come from? Uh, and what are these sort of funny drops or steps through these pits? So when we're looking at the hydraulic grade line, we can talk about the pressure as pressure losses. So as we go from the upstream, we've got a certain amount of pressure. And as we come to the downstream, that actually drops down. So you've got a loss in pressure. And in this case, one of the reasons why you're losing pressure is due to pipe friction. So the water trying to flow through the pipe, it's actually slowing down around the walls of, of the pipe itself. Um, and so you're losing pressure or energy that's running through your system. So in order to work out how much pressure or head you might be losing through the pipe itself, it's a function of, or a product of your pipe length and the slope of the hydraulic grade line. So that's what we call the friction slope. And that's what I mentioned before. The friction slope is not your pipe grade. They are different things. So your friction slope can be flatter or steeper than your pipe grade. And so if you multiply your friction slope by the length of the pipe, you will get a, a, an approximation of how much um, pressure or head is lost through that pipe. And that helps us to actually draw that hydraulic grade line and calculate those values. So again, friction slope is not the same as pipe slope. So just remember that one. Now you've probably seen the, the little steps in the HGL going through the pits. So they are losses uh, that are also occurring and they're due to either having a junction, a structure, a bend or an obstruction in your pipe uh, alignment. And so when the pipes have to change direction and when they discharge into an open um, uh, chamber, you're gonna get a lot of turbulence. The water's gonna kind of hit the walls and bounce around. Uh, and so a lot of that upstream pressure that was uh, concentrated through your pipe, that pressure or some of it is actually dispersed and, and lost through that pit. So that's what we call a, a pit loss. Uh, and again, to calculate how much that loss is in, in pressure in the head, uh, we've got another simple equation here. So our head loss is equal to a factor, a K factor, uh, multiplied what we, by what we call a velocity head, which is basically taking your downstream velocity in your pipe, um, squaring that, and then dividing it by two times gravity. So it's a pretty simple equation. Um, and the, the real trick comes to calculating that pressure change coefficient or the structure loss coefficient. Uh, sometimes you'll hear K values being uh, used or spoken about in the office. That's what they're talking about when it comes to drainage. The K value is um, your pressure loss coefficient. Uh, and that will uh, directly affect how much that pressure actually uh, uh, loses or, or the magnitude of that loss inside each pit. So they're just a couple equations. We're not gonna run through uh, and getting that deep uh, today, but just to give you a bit of insight as to where those numbers uh, can come from. So we looked at the hydraulic grade line. And so that's basically showing an effective water level or how much pressure we have in the system. We also have what's called a total energy line. Now this is above the hydraulic grade line and it's measured by a vertical difference that's equal to the velocity head. So our total energy line there is above our HGL by that particular value. So it's based on your downstream velocity uh, and gravity. So you do that calculation there and you'll be able to see how much total energy you have within your system. Now, another note as well, if your velocity uh, was um, zero or very, very low, um, let's say it was insignificant, your HGL and total energy line, your TEL would actually come down and, and meet your HGL. So they'll coincide. So if this was to discharge, say, into a lake and the water was basically standing, there was no real velocity, you'll see your total energy line will actually drop and meet your HGL. So if you do ever see that, uh, that that's the reason behind it. And it's really important. And the, the reason why I want to try to explain some of these concepts, um, not all of you um, may go into real hardcore uh, stormwater calculations and HGL analysis, 
But if you kind of understand some of the concepts, hopefully what you might be able to do is pick up on uh, maybe small errors in your designs that you might have, or at least ask questions where you think maybe something doesn't look right, or you don't quite understand what's happening in the system. So all too often, we're uh, really busy. We've got to uh, you know, commit to deadlines and uh, undertake designs and get into documentation. And there's a lot of reliance on computer software to actually crunch the numbers uh, and then give us an output. And so hopefully what I'm trying to do here is just give you a bit more awareness and maybe just uh, don't rely on the software so much and try to interrogate some of those calculations and outputs that you're getting. All right, so we've looked at hydraulic grade lines, HGLs, total energy lines, TELs, and now we've got one final thing that we should check in our pit and pipe design, and that's the water surface elevation or WSE. So our water surface elevation within a pit is not actually at the HGL. So most often than not, it'll be a little bit higher than your hydraulic grade line um, uh, level. So that's a theoretical value that we're using, but in fact, the water surface might be a little bit above that. So we can calculate what that water surface actually is, um, and we use a slightly different K value. So when it comes to pit losses and looking at that step that you see within the pit, you'll be looking for two K values, a KU and a KW value. So the KU is the junction pit pressure change coefficient, and that will help you get the step that you can see here on that image. KW is a different coefficient used to calculate your water surface elevation. So that will give you your step using a KU value for your HGL, but your water surface elevation usually will be a little bit above that hydraulic grade line. And so you can work out what that step is or that distance by using a different K value in this case, KW. And it's really important to do this because we need to know where that water surface elevation is because we need to provide freeboard in our pit and pipe design. And typically across Australia, that freeboard needs to be 150 millimetres below the surface level or below the grate. So once you have the water surface elevation, you can compare that to your surface level. If you don't, um, uh, achieve that 150 mil freeboard, uh, then your design is, is over capacity and you have to um, change that design. All right. Give you guys a few seconds because there, there was a lot to sort of uh, take in there. There's, um, but again, I don't want you to, and it's really, it's impossible to just take that in and completely um, uh, understand it and process it straight away. But hopefully you'll be able to have this webinar uh, as a bit of an um, arsenal in your, in your tool belt. So if you have any problems at work or if you've got any um, uh, niggling questions, you can always revert back to this and then pull up um, some of this information. When we come to hydraulic calculations for pit and pipe design, there are three different models that we can use. These three models I've shown here on the diagrams, uh, and we'll see that in the coming slides. So you can use a simple steady flow open channel model, or you can use a steady flow pressurized grade line model, or a complex unsteady flow model. So when I say steady flow, that means that the discharge remains the same through each link. It's not actually changing within the pipes themselves. And that's a, a bit of a simplistic approach, but it's what we do for pit and pipe design to try and speed up that process. So we'll look at those in a little bit more detail now. So this is the open channel model. Now, what this assumes is that first we have steady flow. So the flow doesn't change throughout the, um, the flow rate, doesn't change throughout the pipe reach. And then we assume that the hydraulic grade line is set to the pipe obvert. So you won't see that HGL jumping up within the pits. And this is because we're assuming that the flow running through all of our pipes is actually running as an open channel and it's just shy of meet, meeting the top of that pipe. So it's an assumption that we make 
um, and it's not suitable for all cases, but it allows us to do a very fast um, and effective, uh, I guess, conceptual design using this sort of method. So we calculate the hydraulic grade line uh, based on uh, the obvert or slightly lower uh, than the obvert, but typically we just take that obvert level. We determine the design flow by using the rational method calculations. So this will then throw you back to webinar one if you wanna go back and have a bit of a refresh there. But the rational method will allow us to work out how much water is dropping into our inlets and then how much we now need to convey through our pipes. So we treat this as uh, a series of connected open channels. And this assumes that the system's flowing full, but it's not under pressure. So our HGL is right down the bottom near that uh, the, the pipe obverts, and then our total energy line will be just slightly above that. And again, the difference between those two profiles is your velocity head. So using this open channel model, which is, is, is uh, the simplest uh, method out of these three, we use two equations. We use Manning's equation, which will calculate the velocity of the flow rate uh, of the flow going through our pipes. And then we can use the volumetric flow rate equation, Q equals VA, to work out what that pipe discharge rate actually is. And just a tip there for anyone that's maybe thinking about Excel and, and jumping in and creating some spreadsheets to, to make your life a lot easier. Uh, when you're using Manning's equation, the hydraulic radius is usually the trickiest one to calculate and sometimes a bit of an iterative approach uh, because your depth will change and then your velocity will change. You sort of go back and forth. But for this open channel model, we've got pipes that are circular and we're assuming that they're going to be flowing full. So that allows us to really simplify that equation. So our hydraulic radius is equal to our area divided by our perimeter. But we can then rearrange that and you'll find that that hydraulic radius is equal to your pipe diameter divided by four. So it goes away from working out the area and the perimeter and mucking around there. And hopefully that saves you a bit of time as well. Okay, so that was the open channel design uh, method, which is really simple, really easy to use. And that's what we're gonna assume for some calculations at the end of this webinar. The next one is the pressurized grade line model. And this is not what we can cover today. There's, uh, that's a whole other session or two on its own. Um, but this assumes that hydraulic grade line um, with the pressure head within the, the pits that we kind of saw at the, uh, the earlier part of this uh, webinar. So this assumes the hydraulic grade line is above the pipe obverts, which indicates to us that there's pressurized flows. It's not flowing as an open channel. You've actually got more force that's pushing through those pipes. Now you could probably see, and you could probably imagine if the pressure is forcing a higher velocity through the pipes, you're gonna be able to discharge more uh, stormwater through those pipes. Your velocity is higher and your peak discharge rate will be higher. So this design is more efficient. It's not as conservative as that open channel design. So this is typically what we use for all of our detailed design analysis. They use a, a very different equation. Uh, so not using Manning's anymore because Manning's equation is only for open channels. So now because it's pressurized, we typically use the Colebrook White equation. Now I won't go into this in great detail, um, but there are more factors that you need to consider. So it does become a little bit trickier um, when you start to get into the, the full HGL analysis. Then finally, we have what we call the unsteady flow model. So unsteady, meaning that your um, discharge rate through the pipe will vary throughout the pipe itself. So at the upstream end of the pipe, you might have um, maybe supercritical flow, different velocity, uh, and then down the bottom, maybe it goes into subcritical flow or even backwater uh, flows. So it's pretty complex. Now, this type of model is dependent on time. 
So the previous models we were looking at, open channel and pressurized HGL analysis is all based on rational method calcs and a peak discharge rate. So the worst or the highest discharge rate in a split second in time. This unsteady flow model actually takes time into consideration. So at say two minutes, you'll see the flow rate will be down the bottom. At three minutes, it will actually build up a bit more. Maybe five minutes, it starts filling up in the pits, eight minutes and so on. And then it goes, you know, as the, the storm peters off, those flows will then, um, or water surface will then drop as well. So it fluctuates throughout each of those storm events. Now, the biggest problem with this analysis is that there's a lot more uh, number crunching involved. So usually we require computer programs to analyze this sort of analysis. So for our uh, standard pit and pipe design, typically we don't do this sort of analysis uh, for, for our um, more common, simpler sort of um, projects, I suppose. So again, they're the three models that we're looking at. We've got open channel at the top, pressurized grade line model in the middle, and then a complex model at the bottom. So we're going to focus really on that open channel model at the top uh, in the calculations towards the end of this webinar. So we use open channel model for concept designs or really quick calculations. So literally just pen and paper and a calculator, and you can run through and design a pipe network system using this model. Uh, and it's very effective. I, and personally, I love it, but it's still fun, you know, decades on, uh, and I'm still crunching numbers and doing pipe design. And it is really, really quick and quite satisfying to knock out a, a full pipe system, you know, in a half a day. Uh, then you get into the pressurized grade line models. And this is where you jump into our computer software to actually run that detailed design analysis. When you need to analyze real storms, so ensembles and um, uh, rising limbs of hydrographs, um, or if you need to consider volume, if there's detention systems that are involved, then you need to uh, consider the complex model that we see at the bottom. All right, again, a couple of seconds just to <laughs> uh, digest all of that. So I promise that was the trickiest, hardest, um, most technical, I suppose, part uh, of the webinar. There's two things I really wanted to put into this webinar that I, I find really important and also something that is missed um, quite often in the industry. So I've obviously worked for a, a number of different consultancies uh, and now with Quilty Engineering Hub, uh, that nets even um, wider again. I'm talking to heaps of other consultants, uh, designers, engineers, um, and I can see time and time again that there's two things, and really it's it's one thing that's being missed, and that is your tailwater conditions. So a tailwater condition is how you establish your starting hydraulic grade line. So when you do a HGL analysis, typically you'll uh, work from upstream and work out your hydrology catchment analysis, uh, all of your inlet uh, designs, you work upstream and work your way downstream because it's kind of a cascading effect. And then when it comes to your HGL analysis, the most common method is to start at your downstream end where your water is discharging out of your pipe, calculate what that starting HGL is, and then work your way up the system. And that's where a lot of people um, either overlook that starting HGL or don't really understand uh, what they should be adopting. So the next few slides is gonna talk about this starting HGL, and we're even gonna talk about connecting into an existing system, which happens very often, and, and a lot of the time it gets um, mistakenly uh, analyzed. So starting your HGL is essential for what we call backwater analysis, which is your HGL starting from downstream, working your way up. So the important thing to remember is the designer that's on this will have the decision to influence your design and ultimately the performance of this built infrastructure. And this is gonna be in the ground for 100, up to 150 years for some councils. 
So coordination with your uh, council, the regulating authority, uh, to double check and confirm your assumptions for this starting HGL is really, really important. And if you can start that conversation early, um, the earlier the better. So when we're starting our hydraulic grade line, it depends on the relationship between the calculated tower water level in the receiving waterways, the critical depth of our flow that's going through our pipe at the outlet, and the obvert level of our pipe. So there's a relationship and the water levels will actually work um, with all of those factors involved. So we've got three scenarios here that we're going to look at. So if your tail water level is above the pipe obvert level, then your hydraulic grade line is set to that tail water level. So let's imagine without that pipe that's shown here, imagine this was just a standing lake and the water was already there, it's just standing at a certain level. That's what we would call the tailwater level. <clears throat> now, in this case, that tailwater level is above our obvert level. And so when this happens, we start our hydraulic grade line at the tailwater level, and then we continue up. And a lot of the time, I'll see designs that this sort of analysis or check isn't really done. And a lot of people would just start your starting HGL at your obvert level, regardless of what's happening downstream. Um, and it's a common practice that I've seen, and it's something definitely to watch out for. Another scenario here, uh, let's say we've got a pipe that discharges into an open channel. So if our tail water level is below our pipe obvert level, and it's above our critical depth, then our starting HGL is set to the pipe obvert level. So let's say our uh, tower water level is based on the normal depth of our channel. So we've got a certain amount of water that's going to be in the system, and we're trying to push this water uh, into that um, downstream water body as well. <clears throat> So our tower water level is below the obvert, but it's above our critical depth. So when it lies within that range, we start our hydraulic grade line at the obvert level. And then the final condition that you might see is where our tower water level is below the pipe invert. So it's at a much lower level, or it might be below the critical depth. So when that happens, we can start our hydraulic grade line at the normal depth of flow in our pipe. So that downstream tower water level doesn't really affect how our hydraulic grade line is going to um, start essentially in our system. So if your tower water level is much lower than your invert level or the critical depth, then we start from the normal depth of flow within that pipe. Now, another thing that you might come across <clears throat> is when your pipes are discharging into a tidal system. So you might have, um, say, uh, the Brisbane River here in southeast Queensland. Uh, it, it is a tidal system. Uh, and so your tides are going to rise and uh, lower over time throughout the day. And so if your pipes are quite deep and it's below the, uh, the actual water level at certain times, that water is just going to flow straight into your pipe systems. So just a, a bit of an um, uh, idea, I suppose, to think about. Um, tidal systems or floodgates might be an appropriate choice. Uh, and it's essentially just a, a big open gate that sort of just opens when the pressure increases upstream. And then when the tides come in, it'll close that uh, system shut uh, to ensure that no water flows upstream into your system. Uh, but just to, a couple of things to look out for, because again, this, this comes up quite often as well. These gates, especially the larger ones, they're, they're pretty heavy. Um, and so they do need a little bit more pressure upstream to physically open up those gates. So you need to consider those head losses uh, when you uh, adopt those, those systems. Maintenance, uh, like anything that we build, maintenance is absolutely crucial. 
especially if you're going to get uh, debris or if you're in saltwater conditions and you're going to get all sorts of uh, buildup, uh, you might actually um, uh, you know, fuse that gate shut, which will cause some pretty big issues. And then finally, uh, what I love to do in all my designs is do a sensitivity analysis. So what if that floodgate was to fail and it was blocked and you had a big downpour for your design storm, where would all that water go? So you may not need to design the infrastructure for it, but you certainly need to see what are the risks and what are the impacts. And if, it, it, if it's too big an impact or too big a risk, then you might need to uh, redesign. Okay, so that were the tower water levels. And um, in a similar sort of vein, when we're looking at connecting into an existing piped network, uh, it's something to also consider. So we know um, all of our existing systems, so you can see here, that's an existing stormwater network uh, that I've pulled out of a GIS. Um, as we urbanize and, and we uh, develop more and more land, we're increasing the discharge rates. Uh, we all know that and understand that now. Um, so that's potentially overwhelming our uh, existing uh, systems that we have in place. So a lot of the time we'll need to connect into an existing pit for our design. So our site might be developed and then we've got a, an access chamber out in the road and that's our lawful point of discharge. So the structure losses need to be assessed when we're connecting into that existing system. Now, ideally, the existing hydraulic grade line within that existing pit would be just measured on site during our Q2 event. And we would just say, yes, that's the level that we're gonna use. But clearly that's impractical. No one is measuring those storms and going out there, the tape measure um, right at the peak of the storm to see what that HGL actually does. So we need to estimate a starting hydraulic grade line or a tower water level. And when I say estimate, a lot of the time we're making educated guesses. So there's a big risk there when you uh, approximate a tower water level. So before we adopt the tower water level condition, <clears throat> we need to understand how that existing system is performing. So we know we can't physically measure, that's impractical, but we might need to analyze the existing network and the existing catchments that are contributing to this access chamber and the downstream system uh, that it, it connects to as well. So that's a pretty big task, um, but sometimes that is something that you need to do. What I suggest is always liaise with your council or the authority uh, as soon as possible to try and uh, uh, work out what's the best, uh, most educated uh, estimate of that tower water level. And of course, council, they own all these assets, so they will be uh, probably more aware of any uh, existing issues, any flooding concerns, any systems that maybe are over capacity, and you can start that conversation early. So just quickly to get you thinking about these tower water levels and how they might impact your design. So this existing pit might have a minor event HGL that looks like this. So in a minor event, the water builds up to that level. So we come and connect upstream and our connection of an, our new system will probably perform well. The existing water level was pretty low and we're pouring in a bit more water, but there's clearly capacity. But what if that minor HGL was a bit higher than, than the uh, previous one? So we have our proposed system and we connect into that existing. And because that downstream tower water level or hydraulic grade line was higher, it's going to force the rest of our upstream system or upstream HDL higher as well. So it may still perform as we need to, though those water levels will be higher. Now, what if this happens? What if we have an existing system that's already close to or at capacity? So I think you could probably imagine what's going to happen if we try to connect a, a piped ne network into this uh, access chamber. Now this happens more often than not, and there are times where it's been missed and you've connected pipe networks into a system that's at or over capacity. So as you can imagine, we simply cannot force any more water into that pit and pipe system. It's already at capacity. So what will happen? We will surcharge all of our 
uh, proposed pits that we're wanting to build. And clearly that's not going to achieve any of our flooded widths, uh, depth, velocity products, uh, and keep society uh, and the community safe. So just something to think about when you are connecting into an existing system, think about how you adopt uh, that starting tower water level. Now, when you don't know what that water level is, one of the most common um, industry practices that we do, we adopt a starting tower water level 150 mil below the great inlet or lid level, basically your surface level. So you'll take that as your starting tower water level uh, there. Now you can imagine that's a pretty conservative approach because you're not gonna fit much more water into that system. So this is where I suggest you talk to council uh, and really understand what that tower water level is doing. And if you have no other information, then you may have to adopt that as you're starting HGL. All right, so uh, we've only got about five or 10 minutes left. And this is when we're gonna jump into the hydraulic calculations. <clears throat> now, don't be afraid, that's a, a typical stormwater calc table that we see there. We're not going to that level of detail today. Um, I'll show you just a very quick way you can start to approximate pipe sizes um, using a um, very simple equation and even a lookup chart. So you don't even need the calculator. So this approach that we're gonna look at relies on the open, open channel model. So remember that's a series of connected open channels assuming our flows are flowing, uh, our pipes are flowing full, but not under pressure. So this is based on Manning's equation. And what we use for this, um, or what we can use, one tool that we have are design nomographs. So these graphs are basically a Manning's equation, but all the values are put on there for, for varying uh, parameters. This allows us to very quickly approximate pipe capacity um, and it's very useful co for concept designs, but I must warn you, do not use this for detailed design. The open channel model is not designed for a detailed design analysis. Um, so generally it'll be conservative, but there's cases where the design just will not work or you might under design by using the open channel method. So it's a good place to start, but you really should be going into the proper pressurized HGL analysis for your detailed design. All right, so here is the, uh, the chart that we have, the nomograph. And so let's say we need to pipe 100 liters per second, but we know that our pipe grade is limited to one in 50 or a 2% grade. We can't get any steeper than that. And we know if our pipe is steeper, the velocity is going to increase and our peak discharge rate is going to increase. So the steepest that you can have your pipe, that's the best case that you're going to have for that pipe. So what we do is, in this case, we look at 100 litres per second on the, uh, on the Y axis. We read across and then we look at our pipe grade on the X axis, in this case, 1 in 50 and we find the intersecting point of those two values. So in this case, our intersecting point lies between two diagonal lines that you see there. It lies between the 225 millimeter diameter and the 300 millimeter diameter. And so what this tells you is that because our intersecting point is above the 225, it means a 225 diameter is too small. It won't discharge 100 liters per second. The 300 millimeter is slightly above our intersecting point. So the 300 diameter will discharge 100 liters per second. And there's a bit of room in there as well. It'll actually be able to discharge a little bit more. So if we need to discharge 100 liters per second, we would adopt a 300 diameter because we know that we'll be able to take it. And in this case, we've got a little bit of uh, room in there as well for extra capacity. Uh, the other useful feature of these graphs is that it also shows you the velocity. So at those two intersecting points, we can see that our pipe will discharge between 
one and a half meters per second to two meters per second. And you can do a linear interpolation there and say it's probably about 1.8 meters per second for our velocity. Now we can, we can read this chart in a few different ways. So that was one example. We can reverse engineer that to check the capacity of any given pipe diameter. So for example, a 450 diameter main at a 1% grade. So we take the 450 mil line that you see here, take our pipe grade, in this case 1%, and then we can read across to see what sort of discharge rate that pipe will take. So in this case, it's between two to 300. Uh, and if we read a bit closer, it'll say that it's uh, got a discharge capacity of 285 liters per second. Okay, so that's how we can read those design nomographs for really quick approximation for pipe sizes. Now, finally, we get to have a look at an example site and how we can crunch some of these numbers in a really quickly way. I won't run through the whole system itself, but I will show you how to get started and you'll be able to adopt the same process um, that we'll see for a couple pits and pipes. You can do the same thing for hundreds, thousands of pipes within your system. So we start with a plan of development. So you might get a master plan from a, a planner surveying consultancy. And in this case, let's say it's a subdivision. So our first step <clears throat> is to obtain existing contours. We need an idea of what the existing topography is doing. So again, uh, and we've spoken about this in previous webinars, this could be through LIDAR, council mapping, GIS, site inspections, or survey. The next step is to approximate your road grading. So your pipes are gonna be installed below your roads typically. Uh, and so if we understand how steep the roads are, we know that our pipes are gonna uh, follow a similar sort of a grade. Now, when you're doing a really preliminary design, you can assume that your roads are gonna pretty closely follow the existing topography. Um, obviously that's not always the case, but it's a pretty good starting point because we want to make sure we minimize earthworks. And so if the existing grades at about 5%, you can assume your road's going to be pretty similar to that. So with your plan of development and some contours, you'll be able to quickly mark up what those road grades might be. The next step is to approximate your lot grading. So you want to see which uh, direction your lots are going to grade. Are they going to grade towards the road or away? And again, thinking about earthworks and um, minim minimizing the amount of work you need to do. So in this case, I might just um, uh, nominate a design where our lots are going to grade towards the road. Uh, typically, that's what I prefer to do as well, uh, just to reduce any flooding issues that you might have inside the lots. You might as well try to push it out onto the road. In this case, we've got a little drainage channel towards the bottom corner there as well. So once you've got that grading sorted, you can then start to look at the catchments. <clears throat> so one of the first things you look at is the total site catchment. So this will identify your catchment boundaries, but it will also identify any external catchments that you might have. So flows that we have coming into our site, that's outside of our boundary. Uh, you can identify any ridges or valleys that you might expect in your design, uh, and also a lawful point of discharge. Where is this, uh, all of this water actually going to discharge to? So once you have an idea of what's happening at a large scale from a catchment perspective, we then jump into our inlet locations. So we put in some trial locations where these inlets are gonna be. So you can see my um, uh, <laughs> uh, dodgy, I suppose, markup that I've got here. Um, I saved my time. I didn't draft in CAD this time. I just jumped in GIS. So it's, it's a little bit sketchy, but I, hopefully you get the picture. So these blue symbols are all of our gully pits. 
uh, and then we have a pipe system in orange and access chambers with the orange circles. And then we have a head wall in the bottom left corner. So when you have your inlet uh, design, you need to make sure that your sag inlets are located at every low point, any sag location, you need an inlet, obviously. Um, and then you can position your on-grade pits at any intersection curb returns <clears throat> um, to, to at least start. And then obviously a head wall at the point of discharge. Once you have your inlets um, positioned, you can then jump into uh, drawing in your sub catchments for each inlet. So this is where the rational method comes into it, working out your peak discharge. And if we think back to the last webinar, remember your catchment flow, approach flow, inflow and bypass flow. So once you understand that, you'll be able to draw up all of your sub catchments for every inlet that you have and then calculate those values for the discharge rates. <clears throat> so we're just looking at uh, the upstream end of, of the uh, pipe system here. And again, when we look at the catchments and the inlet design, you always start at your upstream end and work your way downstream. So you can approximate your pipe size based on the fact that your pipe needs to convey the same amount of flow that your pit captures. Whatever the flow is that goes into the pit needs to be pushed through those pipes. So the pipe grades can be based on assumptions, <clears throat> especially at an early concept stage, you may not have um, uh, exact design levels and covers and all those sort of requirements, but you can still approximate these pipe sizes. So in this case, let's say we did a rational method calculation on the subcatchment and we've got 90 liters per second that's going into the inlet. That means the pipe needs to convey that same discharge rate. And in this case, because they're right at the upstream end, I might just assume a 1% minimum grade for these pipes. On the other catchment, let's say it was a similar size catchment, so similar discharge rates. So there are those two pipes. Then we have a downstream pipe that's collecting both of those upstream pipes. So the cumulative flow is going to be 90 plus 90 being 180 litres per second. And in this case, let's say our road grade was approximately 3% based on LIDAR. We can assume that our pipe grade will, will be similar, let's say 3%. So we can approximate these pipe sizes based on the pipe nomographs. So again, going back to those charts, I can quickly look up and see that for a 300 mil diameter at a 1% grade, it has a capacity of 96 litres per second, and we only need it to convey 90. So a 300 mil diameter will do the job. Same flow rate on the other side of the road in this case, so we can adopt the same pipe size. And then we look at 180 litres a second flowing through this uh, downstream pipe. And looking at those nomograph charts, we can see that a 375 diameter actually has more capacity at 3% grade. A 300 mil diameter you'll find doesn't have enough. So a 375 is a good start. So that's how you'll be able to approach a pipe design and basically work your way from upstream all the way down um, adding up, summing up all those flow rates going through your pipe system. Now again, <clears throat> this approach works really well for concept designs. Detailed designs have a much more accurate way um, of analyzing time of concentration, um, taking into account pipe flow uh, times as well. And obviously a whole heap of other stuff we need to think about when it comes to pipe cover, um, and actual design levels and that sort of thing. So just a few uh, common uh, problems or content uh, topics that come up within the industry. So if, you, if you're not 100% confident in any of these, please get in touch and we can, we can reach out and teach you. Um, obviously we offer uh, individual coaching and training uh, and also group training as well. And we offer that to consultancies 
councils uh, and water and sewer authorities as well, where we can come in for say a half day, do a quick workshop and cover anything that you might need uh, a bit of upskilling in. All right, thanks very much guys. I'll um, hand you back over to Dan now and hopefully we've got a few questions to, to answer. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. We had yeah, a few questions that have come through for you. Um, it was an interesting talk and I haven't really, I'm not really involved in this space. So it was interesting to kind of see how much more how like, complicated and in interesting this space can be. But yeah, let's get into the questions because I see we've gone just over the hour mark. So people might start leaving, but questions. Yep. So the first question that came through was from Elizabeth, which was, where are these K values found? And so earlier on, you were talking about with some diagram of K values. So I guess, yeah, where do yeah, those come definitely. from? So the, the K values are based on testing <clears throat> that people have done in the past, and then they'll create some nice handy charts that we can look at. Um, OSROADS Guide to Road Design Part 5A that I pointed out at the start, it does have a nice, uh, just a start, a nice neat table in there that has some typical K values for different pit configurations. That's probably a good starting point. To then jump into it and do some more detailed analysis, if you go to the back of QDOM, uh, there's a heap of hair uh, charts, so hair being the, the author of, of the charts themselves, uh, and there's lots of different configurations. That's probably my pick, but you'll need a copy of QDOM and it's about five or $600. So if your company has a copy, definitely find that. Uh, and go back to the Appendix A, I think it is, uh, and you'll find it there. Um, the next question is from Arisa, which was, K, K, U, and KW pressure change coefficients. Are these empirical coefficients or do they have mechanistic origins? Uh, they are unitless. Uh, the origins, and so I don't think so. I think it is all Australian based, I believe. Um, the authors here, and there's another one as well, uh, and I think Missouri as well, I think they were Australian based, but they are unitless. It's all um, uh, Australian based. If you needed to do some American calculations, don't quote me on that. Maybe um, shoot an email or we'll start a conversation there and just double check just in case. Sounds good. Um... So next question. From Zoe, isn't the TWL changing throughout the year? How can we get accurate TWL? Yes, yeah, it's a good question. That tower level is changing, uh, even daily, you know, especially in tidal uh, situations, that's going to fluctuate on an hourly basis. <clears throat> that's where we need to make some um, educated sort of approach to what might happen. And that then becomes a bit of a, a, a risk analysis and say, well, what if um, uh, sort of scenarios? Um, I can't give you an exact answer of what you need to do, but I always check uh, the worst case scenarios, basically a spectrum of issues that might occur. Um, if your uh, floodgates fail, what happens? Um, if your floodgate and everything's working perfectly, what happens if we have uh, you know, your peak design storm at the exact same time as we have the highest astronomical tide. It's unlikely, but it does happen. Um, so those sort of things do occur. Uh, and it, 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 yeah, it really is a bit of a conversation that you sort of um, uh, have with the asset owner as well and see what that balance is. Yeah. Um, next question was from Maria, which was what maximum minimum pipe lane depth? So I'm not too sure which pipe. slide this was about. Yeah, pipe, pipe depth. La laying depth. It? So maximum and minimum laying pipe. depth. Yes, yeah, um, laying depth. Yes, yeah, cool. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, so uh, obviously we couldn't cover it in here, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but minimum cover, there's uh, certain requirements. Um, 650 mil is a pretty good uh, starting point. It does depend on what's happening above that surface, <clears throat> and it depends on when you're looking at that pipe as well. So if the pipe's in the ground, uh, in the ultimate case, the road's all built, uh, the design's finished, uh, that 650 mil might work well for uh, traffic running over your road, but there's other factors to consider as well. So during construction, 
you've got that 650 mil of road pavement plus a bit of earth protecting your pipe. But when you're constructing, you haven't even built that road yet. All of a sudden, you've only got about two or 300 mil of just earth over the pipe. And so that can be an issue. And that's something we need to consider uh, during construction and construction loads. Um, but there's ways around that and you can protect that through the construction phase. Um, the other thing that trips uh, a lot of us up as well, you could use minimum pipe covers that are prescribed, but if you've got say a pipe diameter and you've got your minimum 650, you've also got electrical, water, telco, and they'll have a similar sort of pipe cover of maybe you know, five, 600 mil as well. And so if those two cross, typically you're gonna have a clash and you just won't physically be able to do that. So anytime you're using minimum pipe covers, I typically add a good few hundred mil on top of that for my stormwater design, because a lot of the time you get to detail design and you'll have electrical or water running across your stormwater and you'll need to push that down anyway. So if you can bring that into the concept design, you might avoid a few headaches down the track. Good. Um, the next question was, can HGL be the pipe capacity? Can the hydraulic gray line be the pipe capacity? Um, so pipe capacity, it's interesting that one actually, like, um, so I use 12D model uh, for the majority of my pit and pipe design. Um, and as an example, I'm pretty sure that pipe capacity value that's sort of printed out in the design, I'm pretty sure that's based on a Manning's equation, which is different to um, what would actually happen in a HGL because you would have pressurized flow. And so you'll get a different pipe capacity, if you like, if you're using a Manning's equation or if you're using Colebrook White uh, as a pressurized system. So I'm not too sure about the question. Definitely uh, hit me up afterwards if you like and get in touch. We can probably uh, take it offline, but it's, um, yeah, I think there's a little bit more there to unpack. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, the next question is from Larissa. You talked about critical depth when talking about tailwater level. What is the critical depth? How do you determine it? Similarly, what is the normal depth? How do you determine it? Could <laughs> Great have a long question. question. <laughs> yes. No, that's good. And, and that's, uh, I mean, um, so obviously we offer um, online training courses, mini courses online at Quilty Eng Hub. Um, and that's something that I'm working on at the moment. Um, that there's probably a 20 minute discussion in there. Look, essentially your critical depth, and I, I'm not even gonna try to draw it with my hands because it's gonna be silly. Your, your critical depth is the depth of flow that you'll have through a channel that produces the minimum amount of energy or requires the minimum amount of, amount of energy to discharge that amount of flow. And I'll leave it there because it's gonna get way too sort of finicky about that. But um, to calculate the critical depth, it's an iterative approach. You kind of, you use a trial value, crunch all the numbers and you say, well, there's a bit of an error there. And you just keep going back and forth and playing uh, on both sides of the equation until you get your, your critical depth itself. Um, next question is from Zoe. Is there a flow velocity limitation for our pipe design? It's two meters a second in AS3500, but five meters a second in IDM. Yes, yeah, that, that's a good pickup. So the pipes, um, concrete pipes or um, <clears throat> polypropylene, whatever we might be using, there are maximum velocities and that's because of scouring. So even a concrete pipe and you think concrete pipe, it's just water flowing over the top, that'll last 150 years. But in fact, with that constant flow of water and at a high velocity, it will eventually start to scour out the bottom of that pipe at the invert. And so if you have a very high velocity, it will start to actually erode the inside of that pipe. Uh, typically, you're looking at like, um, yeah, five, like you said, uh, I think Kudum, um talks about six and seven meters per second, which is pretty fast, but that's your, your limit for the, the pipe velocity. AS3500 is interesting because I think that two meter a second clause that you're thinking about, it's it's a threshold for where the Australian code actually applies. And so if you read it, it'll say, you can do the AS3500 method of pipe design, which is not a HGL analysis. It's a very simplistic approach. But if your velocities are higher than two meters per second, it recommends you do a proper HGL analysis. 
So that two meters per second won't cause any scouring or anything like that. It just means that the code doesn't apply and you've got to do a more um, thorough analysis for that. So next question is for Maria. What are the ways to reduce the depth of the well besides pumps? Is the depth of the well besides pumps? Um, okay, I'm trying to think what that might mean. Um, maybe an offline question for that one. Um, if if you've got a, a well, I guess the chamber itself, and you, you have to push it down to actually fill up that water, I suppose, and then convey it through, uh, there, there's heaps of different ways to change your design to actually get mm -hmm. that um, depth reduced. Um, obviously, increasing the pipe size, <clears throat> but that may not help because if your pipe size is really big, you're going to need a certain amount of cover. Uh, so typically what we've done, especially in Northern Territory, done a fair bit of work up in Darwin, we revert to box culverts. So instead of having a pipe diameter with a certain conveyance, you can actually have a really, really uh, thin but very wide box culvert, and that allows you to rise that right up to the surface. Uh, and box culverts will take a lot more load than your pipe culverts as well, so your cover reduces. So you kind of get a double win out of that one. If I've understood, understood the question correctly. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. a few different ways to do that. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, if any pit drops, will this concept method work? Um, yes, the open channel method, uh, if those pits drop, all you're doing is you've basically got that channel that you're looking at, and it's just relative. You're just pushing that deeper yeah. or raising it up. Uh, so I won't really change that that approach. The place where it does change is if you have that open channel coming down and then you've got a tower water level that is above your obvert, that will start to impact that, that downstream end. Uh, and that's where you go from open channel and you have to go to a, a proper HGL analysis. Yeah. Um, so the next question for you is what software do you suggest for pipe analysis and design? Uh, for rational method, I can't go past 12D model. So they've got a drainage analysis there. <clears throat> and typically that's what I use for all of my pit and pipe design, rational method approach. When it gets more complicated, if there's detention involved or if there's trapped sags, if there's backwater effect that might occur, the rational method just gets thrown out the window. It can't do that, it doesn't work. When that happens, I typically go to drains. So Watercom drains. Um, and that's a nice node link type uh, interface. And then I'll push my pit and pipe design into drains and you can run all sorts of um, ANR ensemble, uh, uh, temporal patterns, you look at detention and you really get into the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so question from Phil, what kind of pipe roughness values would you use in Colebrook wire for concrete and PVC pipes? Oh, off the top of my head, uh, I've got to get the units right. I always mix them up. I think it's 0. 0.6 millimetres is your K value for Colebrook White for concrete, I think. But don't quote me. Uh, and then it goes down to like 0. 0.13 mil maybe for PVC. Um, but yeah, very, very small. But something that's tripped me up a few times is the units because then in the equation, and I can't remember which one it is, it might be metres or millimetres, and I've thrown myself out by a factor of a 1,000. So... <laughs> Uh, quickly had to recalculate that. Um, Osroads do have, um, and Qtum, they do have the K values um, uh, there as well, if you want to reference them. Um, next question, so from Sean. What desirable offset would be provided from edge of pit wall to edge of pipe? Example, what is the largest RCP size you should realistically try to fit in the wall of say a 900 by 900 field inlet? Mm, that's a good one. It, it comes up a lot actually. Um, a lot of, cause I've asked these questions too, right? You can imagine how many questions mm. I've asked over my career. <clears throat> and a lot of the time it came back to, well, whatever the contract is comfortable with. Um, but um, it, just some answers that I've had in, in my sort of journey, I suppose. 150 mil clearance is something that's dropped a fair bit. So if you've got your, your, your pit, you've got the wall thickness of that 900 by 900, and then you're going to have 150 clearance and then the outside of your pipe and then your pipe wall. So when you're doing that, typically we'll create pit details. 
uh, that show a plan view of the chamber and the pipes, but you have to consider the actual pipe wall thickness um, and the chamber wall thickness and make sure it's a true representation of the product you're going to use. Uh, so a lot of the time you'll be using pipes, maybe RCPs, and then you'll revert to polypropylene, especially in the latest um, uh, industry that we're sort of seeing at the moment, there's a uh, struggle to get product and that sort of thing. Uh, and that pipe wall thickness might actually double. And so that 150 mil that I'm talking about might get eaten up pretty quickly. So you do have to be careful with that. <clears throat> um, Osteroids do talk about a certain ratio or percentage as well. So if you've got your pipe wall itself and then you're gonna punch a big hole through it, there's a certain, I think it might be like 60%, no more than 60% of that wall width is sort of <clears throat> um, disturbed or, or penetrated through. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, have a look at a few standards. I think the contractor is probably the best person to ask uh, because they will be able to do certain things that maybe the standards don't say you can. Um, and it may not be still a risk to the design, you might be okay. Um, so next question is, in regards to the tail water level, you mentioned earlier that the downstream tail water level is assumed to be 150 millimetres below the surface level of the downstream pit. I would like to know how, I would like to know, does the proposed pipe network upstream achieve enough cover for the stormwater pipe? Yes. Yeah, and, and it's it's such a good question because um, <clears throat> if you assume that tower level is just below the surface, you're basically saying, well, I can't really connect into that system unless your system is a lot higher and then that pressure can kind of force its way through. If the existing pit's here and then your site's only just slightly above, which happens a lot, um, that water that builds up there, anything that's upstream of that is just going to kind of build up as well. So you, you're almost, you're filling up your system before you even get a chance to discharge your site stormwater. Um, so yes, it's, I think I know where the question's alluding to as well. That approach can completely stuff your design. It completely wrecks your design. But unless you've got anything else to go by, you've got to uh, um, adopt that sort of approach. Now that approach is in Osroads. So that's not my recommendation. That That's an Osroads specific recommendation. It's in QDM. Uh, and a lot of councils adopt that as well. And to throw another spanner in the works, in a minor event, it's 150 below the surface. In a major event, you should be adopting, say, the top of curb, which is about 150 above the surface. So then if you go to major analysis, that might even throw you out in a whole other <laughs> different world. Um, any questions, though, if you get stuck, always reach out and we can um, take it offline. Um, I guess a bunch of people were just asking about getting certificates for attendance and where they can access the slides and everything from today. So for everyone, the recordings and the slides will be available at the uh, oceanprotect.com.au slash webinars website. For the people after the certificates, you can get that by inquiries at oceanprotect.com.au. So just send an email and we can get that to you. I guess if other people have any questions or want to get in contact with you, Sean, I guess these details on the screen are the best way to get in contact. Yes, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, don't be shy, you know, connect on LinkedIn. Um, uh, the QR code there will allow you to, to quickly subscribe as well. <clears throat> so we send out monthly newsletters, we've got tips and tricks. Uh, the last couple have been about um, not even stormwater related, but uh, LIDAR, how you can get free LIDAR which kind of comes back to stormwater, I guess, because then you can mm. do your, your pipe design. Um, we talk about climate change and how that affects your rainfall intensity. Um, and then anything that I kind of upgrade or develop, uh, design spreadsheets, my subscribers will get an automatic uh, link to that or an updated version or anything yeah. that we develop. Uh, so yeah, feel free, subscribe um, and get in touch. Well, thanks for the talk today and thanks for everyone coming along. We had nearly a bit over 300... 30 people today so that was big turnout which was good um, and look forward yeah, to seeing everyone at the next one in um, next month yep uh, thanks everyone Definitely. for coming along thanks guys thanks for coming along thanks Dan appreciate thanks, it mate thanks.